What is happening, you guys? Welcome back to the Let's Go Win podcast. You're here for a Tuesday tune-up. We're going to talk about something that I think is absolutely fascinating, and that is how talent is overrated, how anyone can achieve their dreams. And before we get started on it, I was thinking about how cool the subject is because the show is all about helping you be happy, healthy, and wealthy. That doesn't, we didn't say talent in there. At no point did we say you have to be talented. And I was thinking about some of these famous people that have overcome what I would say, they weren't the most talented, but they've become extremely successful. And I'm excited once I get Greg on here, we're going to ask him, but a couple of athletes came to mind immediately. Yvonne Lendl, for those tennis people that really enjoyed it, he was number one tennis player in the world and arguably was not very talented and they talk about it very openly with him but he had systems and he was very disciplined and he was something that he just put into place that allowed him to succeed at the highest level without having the talent quote unquote tom brady is another one he just retired recently you see him coming out of the draft he's the last pick in the draft and he ends up being the most prominent quarterback in super bowl uh uh history arguably the best NFL player to ever play. But if you looked at his body, if you looked at his talent coming out of college, it wasn't exactly off the charts. And then the other one was fascinating. I'm really excited to ask Greg on this. Sylvester Stallone and his story and what he was able to achieve. Now, what most people don't know about him is he has an IQ of around 160. So he's extremely intelligent, even though in the Rocky movies, he kind of plays that slower guy and they were saying his acting ability wasn't quite there. So I just wanted to give some context to some people that we've seen through the years that have really achieved at high levels, but they weren't necessarily considered, you know, talented. And Greg Goddard, who is a pioneer in translating research science to learning superior achievement in the classroom, boardroom, and anything else, he's going to talk about this. And Greg, I'm so excited to have you here, brother. How are you doing? Thanks. It's great to see you. I'm happy to be here. I so, love I love that intro, man. That was great. <laughs> you know, I, I just it's one of those subjects, and I'm so fascinated to get your take because so often, especially you've seen prior to the the book Growth Mindset, this is when I think people started to realize, wait a minute, I can grow, continue to get better. I don't have to be the most talented person. But there was a point where people were like, This is as good as it's gonna get. I guess I should just accept that. I love the work you're doing, brother. So tell me, how'd you dive into this field? Uh, I'm a I'm a recovering high school music teacher. Uh, I did that for years, and I wondered how the heck did I do this from where I'm not even trained in education. I have degrees in music. And now that I can look back, I do realize the performing arts are one of the best places to learn this stuff because the goal of all learning, the goal of anything, is to perform, not to sit there and take 30, 50, 90 seconds to answer a question on a test. Now that's a question for another day. It's probably the most efficient system that we've got testing basic knowledge to see if you're able to perform. Without that knowledge, you wouldn't be able to perform because we have to evaluate millions of people in a very underfunded and poorly run system. It's just the way it is. That's another discussion for another day. The point is it's only performing arts and sports in which you have to perform in the moment, get it right, and then get it right in the next moment and get it right in the next moment. That's how anything, I don't care if it's business, I don't care if it's sports, I don't care if it's anything else, that's how it really works. How successful we are at anything in life will be determined by how well we learn to do that thing. And again, it's part of the system. We don't do that with our tests and with our, and it works for various reasons. But sports and performing arts, and sports has a little bit of a crutch going on, and they do this because there's a lot more money in it, whether it's high school or whatever it is, and, it's, and there's a lot more premium placed on getting people on the field who can perform. So in music, you tell people what to do, then they have to go home and do it on their own, just like in academics. Go figure out how to study on your own, and studying works way different, way different than most people think it does. The very few that get it are the ones who seem talented. Everyone else goes, I tried, Trust me, you didn't try everything. And so in, in sports, we take that practice time and we do it in three hours of practice after school with the coach taking over the reflection part. You did this wrong, do this right. Music, you have to figure out what you did wrong and how to do it right. And so that was my quest. And I, it's a long story. I won't bore you with it. But the first thing I did is I went looking for talent and couldn't find it. That was five years into my high school teaching career. 
okay, if everyone's equal, that's fine. Then what do I do with this? And I started to experiment with some ideas. And then I ran into a book. It's so great that you point out how things kind of changed around the mindset book, which by the way, as an aside, that's when the whole idea of neuroplasticity changed, mm -hmm. specifically adult neuroplasticity. You made the, the statement, we just think we you know, can't do any more than what we have. Heck, science was telling us that around 18 or 25, your brain's pretty much done and that's it. And it was around 2007 or so that it became an accepted idea. Oh my gosh, there's adult neuroplasticity. You can change your brain until you die. Meaning you can get better and better and better at stuff until you, the reason you have to be a child prodigy to be some sort of super duper artist is because you can't start when you're 25 because you have kids and a family and obligations. It has nothing to do with starting when you're a kid. So you brought up mindset. At the same time, a book came out which, it, and we're using the title today, my favorite book of all time, it's called Talent is Overrated. And mm. I read, it's a business book of all things. As a music teacher, I saw talent. I had realized talent, the issue of talent was a problem because there's all sorts of problems, such as you tell someone they're talented and they may max out right there because they feel they shouldn't have to put forth effort. There are all sorts of problems. Talent is not just a mistake. It's a pernicious belief that hurts learning, which we see expressed in mindset. Why do you have a fixed mindset? There's no reason for it. Dweck did 30 plus years of research talking about this. So I read this book. And I said, oh my gosh, there are scholarly answers to everything I've been finding. And all the stuff I've been finding that won me awards as a teacher and I won awards and I did lectures at places, I found was like 2% of the big picture. When I read this book, I'm like, oh my gosh. And that's what started this. I realized I was going to have to read the underlying research for the book. And then if you start doing that, you got to read the underlying research of the underlying research. And then you got to go into the offshoots. That's how I found mindset and flow. You even talked about happiness. Cut me off anytime. I will go on forever. You even well, talked about. I, I do want I want to get to some please, because you've please. got some really, really awesome stuff. Because we're still challenged with mindsets. And I'll give you an example. I had my son is 13. Okay. And he plays baseball. And at some point, a coach said, look, if you don't get on this travel team by this age, you're not going to make it. That was the day I fired him. I was like, look, bud, I don't care how good you played in. I think he played minor league ball and he coached some major league baseball players. But his mindset was literally at 12 years old. If you're not on this travel team, just your baseball career is over. And this was the moment that I, I don't even hesitate at that point because I'm not going to try and fix his mindset, a 60-year-old man that clearly has this fixed mindset. That was the moment I said, no, this is not who I want my child surrounded by because guess what? I remember watching so many kids, you can name swimming, tennis, basketball, and I go sports because I see so much burnout. You can talk, I know in music, you've heard of these prodigies, that are just wildly Absolutely. gifted and they burn out. So how do we, Greg, I mean, the science is there, but it is this overwhelming feel as a parent. Like I, my kids are surrounded by this fixed mindset that if you don't hit this sure. by this, this age, it's not going to happen. It's ridiculous. Well, there might be something to that in the following way because of the way the system is set up. I don't know if you're familiar with, and he fudges his facts a little bit, so be careful with Malcolm Gladwell, but he is an entertaining writer. I don't know he if is. you're familiar with the, right, the book Outliers, and he has a chapter in there in which people born in certain months in Canada are far greater represented in, in the higher levels of hockey and anything else. This has nothing to do with mindset or anything else. It has something to do with when they're led into the training program. Mm -hmm. So if you have the right mindset and everything else and you're taking coaching, other people have a year on you if you don't make it to this particular cutoff. And so that, that means you have a year less training. You tell me you got a bunch of people who are practicing properly or getting good coaching. Who's going to be better after five years, the one with four years or the one with five years? So I, in those cases, I'm not saying it's a totally done deal. There may be a reason. If he doesn't make it by this, he won't make the cut for this team. Then he won't be able to get to this team. Then he won't be able to go to the minors. Then this won't be able to happen. That's a fault of the way the system is set up, now, if, if that is the case. Now, having said that, how do we deal with this whole – I mean, I have a whole – Thing I wrote about how to deal with this. First thing is you point it out all the time when people get better at stuff and you point it out to the learner. Don't let anyone else tell them anything else. There's going to be a million road signs that come up along the way that say, you suck. You can't do it. 
There's no way. And you have to understand, we will react. This is part of Dweck as well. But I saw this in teaching all the time. You're going to say, we're going to react that it's, we're going to feel like it's true. It, it's really hard to put full effort into something when you think it may or may not work. And this is the misunderstanding of talent. We tell kids in school, try really hard in all your classes. Go home and work really hard. Eh, maybe you'll do okay. But we all know that only like two or three percent of people have talent. So you'll probably suck at everything. And then maybe we'll find something you can be good at. If that were the truth, then that's what we should tell people. And that's how we should do it. But it's not the truth. So here is a concrete answer to your question. How do we get around that mindset thing? You find ways. If you look, obviously, I've started doing this in music. I'm years down that road. I go out and coach instruments that aren't even mine because I don't need to know how to play them. They've got a teacher to do that, a coach to do that. I show them how to work on stuff, which is what we don't teach. We don't teach how to learn. We don't teach it in our schools. We should. We don't teach it anywhere. And the first thing I do always, because if I were teaching this first, this second, this third, if I had my way, I wouldn't start with this. But I start with this to get buy-in. I'm sure you know this. It's all about buy-in. If if you're going to get someone to practice something, they better be practicing at 99 to 100% focus and intensity, and you have to be totally bought in. You get buy-in in human beings by getting them to accomplish something they never thought they could accomplish before. Now, we all say that's easy. If he'll do this for four or six weeks, or she'll do this for four or six weeks, they'll get better. That doesn't work, especially with kids, except for the prodigies. It has nothing to do with talent. It has something to do with the ability to hold focus when you're very young beyond most people your age. So what I do is I employ something that seems very unusual, but gets people way better really quick. And then you go to the methods that take longer. When they see that, when they feel internally, they can do something. Now you brought up baseball. I'll give you an example of something you can do with baseball. Uh, I generally use something called contextual interference to do this. If you go to my YouTube channel, you'll see me doing it with musicians. You know, what I do is you play something and then you have to play it in a rhythm you've never played it before. Really, And watch. They'll suck. It'll be terrible. That is where learning occurs. In the struggle, it's called desirable difficulty in the research. In the struggle, the learning occurs. So you actually get worse to get better. Mm -hmm. But since this go happens can happen within 20 minutes, 30 minutes, one day, it happens very quickly. Here's how you do it in baseball. And, and, and there's a, a study on this. San, they did it with the San Luis Obispo baseball team. You know how most people do batting practice. You know, 15 curveballs, 15 sliders, 15, right? What, what? Do it random, random. Don't let them know what's coming. Watch what will happen. Their batting practice will get worse, way worse, worse. The next day, worse. The next day, worse. Watch what happens after the second or third or fourth day. Now put them up to the plate because that's contextual performance. That's how it's going to happen in the game. You're going to have to, you're not going to know curveball, curveball. Now that's good at the very first stage when you need to get your swing right, to catch a curveball and a couple, a little low one, a high one, whatever. But once that's done, once the motor program is done, then you want to test it, real world test it. And that's either going into a game or simulating what happens in a game in practice. Check out the San Luis Obispo uh, baseball player study. Have a, uh, anyone who's a bat, I don't care how bad or good they are as a batter, have them practice this way for a few days. It will blow their minds and that will be the portal, the entry into this type of work. Yeah, I like that. And I want to get back to Gladwell for a second. And here's why. I believe that quality does come through quantity. And what I, and music has proven this again and again, even if you do really suck, but you are passionate about the guitar, this is the 10,000 hour idea that Gladwell brings to the surface where, look, if you commit, really commit to sucking and sucking, but continuing, you're slowly getting better. I like what you're talking about, recognizing, I think, hey, that's an accomplishment. Great job. Keep going because it sucked day one, sucked day two, sucked day three. Oh, wait a minute. Got a little better on four. Now I'm giving you a high five saying, great job. Way to keep up your work. And so this idea of the 10,000 hours, I'm curious how you've seen that because you brought up Gladwell. He's one of my favorite authors, very entertaining, as you said, but I'm super curious to see how that's applying in the world of music that you're seeing. Is quality coming through quantity? Because I know we want to do specific practice. We do want to work on things so we can progress, but I've found in writing for me, that quality comes through a quantity of writing. So what are you seeing, Greg? Well, the thing with you is you have years and years and years and years of study and practice and writing, starting in kindergarten. 
you have tons of practice reading. Every time you read for entertainment, you're practicing and you're performing contextual interference. You see a new word, try to figure it out. You've been doing this for thousands and thousands of hours. So you come to this quantity idea with a great deal of skill. We don't think of reading and writing as a great deal of skill because we all do it. It is an amazing amount of skill. If you could play an instrument as well as you talk, read and write, you'd be a professional. You, you know, maybe you wouldn't be Eddie Van Halen, but you'd be a professional. You mentioned something as you were talking. You said, boy, it's great. After a while, you get a pat on the back. The pat on the back I'm talking about comes from inside. It's when someone else doesn't tell you you did a good job. It's so apparent to you and it happens so quickly that you are and it creates great inspiration There's good research on this that actually solving problems is what the brain learns best that's how flow states are created um, usually you have to be very skilled in the case of deliberate practice you don't have to be that skilled that's how flow states are created so when you're talking about quantity it's when if you have already developed skill yeah throw a lot of quantity at it 10,000 hour rule first isn't really a rule Gladwell made that up uh, if you read Erickson's book, you can figure that stuff out. It's actually more than 10,000 hours. 10,000 hours is to get to a certain level. But it, but Erickson, the researcher, said, hey, it works. It's all good. Um, it, as long as people understand it's not a day, a week, a year. Now, if you just keep trying, you'll eventually get there. But boy, in most cases, if you want to get to the higher levels of performance, it'll take you three, five, ten times as long. And we you just don't have time for that. Those are the people who give up. I tried doing music. I tried. I practiced five hours a day. And I have people tell me, as you might imagine, I have people tell me that all the time. I took piano lessons as a kid. I said, when you practice, did you think about what your teacher told you? No. Did you ask your teacher questions when you saw them at the end of the week and uh, when you had problems? No. Did you think about what you were playing and how you can play it better? No. That's wordless practice. It's, it's, it's a method uh, that, and it's too many people do it in sports and everything else and homework. It's called play and pray. I don't know if you're familiar with, or what I call play and pray. I don't know if you're familiar with um, the book, Thinking Fast and Slow, a Nobel Prize winning researcher, Daniel Kahneman. That is great. We have two systems of thinking, one in which we shortcut all our thinking and we bring that to most situations. It's not laziness, it's the brain trying to conserve energy. There's a good reason for it. And we know it, we walk through a pull door and we push and ah, everyone laughs, no big deal. You make a mistake like that when you're practicing over and over and over again, and you will never get good. That's why we have coaches standing over people. That's why we don't send football players home to practice on their own, because you have to have someone standing there making sure that you do it. In that case, it's assured, but then you don't develop the independent um, thought and self-discipline you need to do things. So you get someone to experience this. There are ways if someone's been practicing and practicing and practicing and getting there and slowly, slowly to juice things up to where you make way more progress really quickly using some of these cognitive science methods that then create the enthusiasm that you need to move forward. So, and the, and the thing about the 10,000 hour rule or, or 20 or, you know, it's 30 for piano now they say, or what, and it's going to keep going up because as we get better methods, that's incorporated into the training. That's why athletes nowadays in high school are running way better times than athletes in, in the Olympics in 1920s. What happened? Where's all the talent? Had nothing to do with talent. It has something to do with training methods. So we're always, that's always going to keep going up. The point about the 10,000 or 50 or whatever it is hours is however many hours you're going to spend working, work in that way. And it's called deliberate practice. And I don't care how many books are written about it. Most people don't know how to do it. Yeah. So the thinking fast and slow, A, that book, you want to talk about, I thought fast about getting it and it's slowly, that book is about that thick. So we're <laughs> here, guys. It is not a simple, it is actually a relatively simple read, but it is a substantial read. It's fantastic, by the way. It, it, it's want, the key. Go ahead. I'm it's sorry. so good. I want to ask you because one of my favorite stories, I, my gosh, this is flying by. One of my favorite stories is an inmate that goes to prison. Now, he through without having a piano and you have music theory, you play music, you do all of this. This man literally had so much time on his hands he decided i'm going to commit to being a concert pianist visualizing visualization yeah are it you works. familiar with this story at all no but i use visualization like crazy in my own practice and my teaching can you talk it about it unbelievably well. yeah i would love for you to just address it really fast because my two favorite ones are two guys that go to jail one comes back he wants to be a scratch golfer he visualizes golf to the I mean imagine that many swings over a 10-year period I think he was in jail the concert pianist was over 12 years 
didn't play a lick of piano visualizes really concerted effort, real thought comes out in his, again, apparently concert level pianist. So talk to me a little bit about the visualization because I find that fascinating. Visualization is super powerful. It works really well. You can do it in your car. You can do it anywhere you want. The problem is most people don't know exactly what it is. So I always have a test for that. A lot of times we're told, you know, if you're a javelin thrower, visualize your right before you do it, your arm going through the motion and the javelin going as far as it can or, you know, shooting the arrow into the bullseye. That's great. You should do that. That's a good thing to do. But that's way too far downstream for what we're talking about. That's when you're actually doing you're in the competition. Visualization works by seeing as clearly as you can, like it's on an HD screen, or in my case, many times split screen, because I have to see two hands, many times split screen, seeing exactly where, where your fingers go, exactly what's going on, hearing the music while you're doing it. And this could be anything. You can use this for golf, as you said, or anything else. The test I use is I say, put your finger on your instrument, whatever, I don't care what piano, okay. How, what, what note? Okay, F, okay. How, how far is your finger, which finger you're using, okay. How far is it from the black key? How far is it from the other key? How far down or in the, and you realize you have a, most people visualize in a very fuzzy way. That doesn't work. It has to be intense and as detail oriented as possible as you go through this visualization. This is separate from what most people say, visualize your success before you get there. That's all, that's good, uh, that's fine. I actually, one time, I tested this. I heard about a concert artist. He gets new works written for him all the time, and he doesn't have time to practice. So he visualizes them on the planes as he travels. And then, so I tried that with a couple of very difficult, very long pieces of music. A couple weeks on a treadmill, just looking at it and kind of making little motions with my fingers. And, and sure enough, when I picked that sucker up, three days of checking out problem sections, and it was ready to go. And I had it all in my mind. In fact, I recommend in music, and I would really recommend this anywhere else, especially in academics, memorize the basic stuff first. Get it into your mind. Get it out of the book and into good visualization, then start working on it. You'll be surprised how well it starts and how quickly it goes. Yeah, brother, your work is fascinating. I could be talking to you for hours on this. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned a couple of times, you mentioned YouTube, you mentioned some really interesting, I, I was trying to write it down, but I was so into the story. So so much of your work, I think, is fascinating. It can apply in so many areas, whether it's, like you said, school, whether it's for work, whether it's for uh, sports, you know, music. So many ways this applies. Where can people find you, Greg, so they can connect with you and, and really learn more about what you're doing? My website is greggoodhart.com, um, and it's largely, it's not entirely. There's plenty of other information there, and there's stuff specifically for other things, but it's mostly music. I did send a link, because um, now I'm, I've am already written a book about music and some other things. Now I'm going to write the, the general skill development book applicable to business and sports and anything else. And so there's some information on that for the link that I sent. And yeah, you got the YouTube thing, and that's about it. I'm terrible at marketing. I don't study it. <laughs> well, guess what? You use your own skills and you could be great at marketing if you become passionate about it. <laughs> There's too many studies to read. I got to stack uh, this high. <laughs> I'm with you, brother. Well, I want to thank you for coming, Greg. I think it's fascinating the work that you're doing. I, I'm excited to see the second book for sure come out. Congrats on the first one. Thank Thanks you. for coming by, man. It was awesome. Thank you very much, Jam. I really appreciate your time. You guys, you have kids. You, you want to to help them succeed you want to you want to get better whatever you're passionate about this is real this is we talked about visualization we talked about some of these abilities to really have concerted effort greg talked about flow there's so much when it comes to our mind that we still don't understand and yet there's enough for you to go apply this today and it can absolutely improve your happiness your health and your wealth Go check Greg out. I appreciate you guys. Until next time, remember, your mindset matters. I appreciate you all. Thank you so much for listening. If this content is delivering value to you, please make sure to subscribe, rate, and review us. That helps us build this community, and that is what we are all about. Building this community as big as we can, helping as many people as we can, and deliver as much value as possible. Be sure to head over to letsgowinpodcast.com for information on my coaching courses and make sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn at Let's Go Win 365. Let's go win and transcend in life. This is the Let's Go Win Podcast with your host, J.M. Ryerson. 